It's January 2009, Canton, Massachusetts. Snow is swirling and sticking to the pavement. Inside Dunkin' Donuts headquarters, a dozen marketing executives file into a conference room. They're here to see a new advertising campaign. As they enter, one executive nudges his colleague. Have you heard about the price tag on this thing? $100 million. That's nuts. How can it be worth it? <clears throat> the brand marketing officer clears his throat. Everyone turns toward him. Believe me, this ad is great. It's based on four words. You can do it. Their frowns deepen. Doesn't sound like a winner. Can? What does that mean? Well, look how it's spelled. He dims the lights and turns on the projection screen. See, it doesn't say you can do it. It says you can do it. K-I-N, the last three letters in Duncan. So you can do it means Duncan Donuts is cheering on everyday people who keep America running. Now here's the ad. I can shovel out this driveway. I can make it to nap time. I can finish off this paperwork. I can put together this swing set by sundown. For over 50 years, Dunkin' Donuts has been making delicious, fresh ground coffee. So to those who keep America running, we say, with a cup of Dunkin' Donuts coffee, you can do it. America runs on Dunkin'. I love it. With this recession, we need something upbeat. Yeah, everyone's cutting back, and extras like store-bought coffee seem to be the first to go. This'll get people's attention. Exactly. We're positioning Dunkin' as the all-day go-to spot for everyday Americans who don't want to pay for extra foam. The underlying message? Dunkin' is for real people. Starbucks is for snobs. The ad airs on radio and television and on Twitter. And it helps, but Dunkin' Donuts isn't immune to the Great Recession. They've expanded beyond the Northeast, opening stores in South Carolina, Nevada, Tennessee, and Florida. But some of those franchise operators are filing for bankruptcy. Dunkin' Donuts needs more than a catchy ad. They need a strong leader. They're about to get one, and he won't waste any time playing Mr. Nice Guy or hesitate to go after Starbucks. From Wondery, I'm David Brown, and this is Business Wars. In our last episode, Dunkin' Donuts expanded into the South and Southwest and internationally, while Starbucks temporarily closed stores to take its baristas back to basics, retraining them to make the perfect cup of espresso. Dunkin' Donuts was cruising, but now, like Starbucks, they're feeling the pinch of the recession. Some people are ducking both establishments and taking homemade coffee to work in thermos bottles. Both companies know they need great leadership to navigate this economy. There's just no margin for error anymore. With Starbucks facing major trouble for the first time, Howard Schultz is searching for ways to make Starbucks irresistible to customers again. And now, Dunkin' Donuts is getting a new CEO, an ambitious Brit eager to lean into Starbucks' weakness. This is Episode 5 a grande fail. A few weeks after the You Can Do It campaign begins, Dunkin' Donuts CEO lands on campus. Gray-haired and impeccably dressed, Nigel Travis strides into his spacious office. The 59-year-old was born and raised in London, but he spent much of his career reviving major American brands like Burger King and Papa John's. Despite the recession, he's bullish on the company's future, especially now when Starbucks is faltering. But he also knows there's trouble in the South. His first call is to a savvy franchise operator with eight stores in Texas. Hello, I'm Nigel Travis, the new CEO. I'm calling because I want to hear about franchisees' concerns. I want to get to know you and hear what's on your mind. Uh, well, to tell you the truth, I'm thinking of selling out and leaving the Duncan system. I, I realize your business isn't as profitable as you want it to be, 
but it's hardly on the brink of disaster. You're right. But for the past couple of years, it's been all about growth at Duncan. Lots of new geographies. I know. Isn't that great? Well, it could be great. There's no real strategy for expansion. Corporate just wants to grow fast without giving its franchisees support and direction. And that just doesn't work well when most new owners don't understand the restaurant business. What don't they understand? The damn menu, for one thing. In Texas, you've got to have an apple fritter or a kolache on the menu to go with the coffee, and they don't have them. Uh, what exactly is a kolache? It's a Texan thing. And why wouldn't you sell Duncan's apple fritters? Uh, that's something everyone loves. Uh, don't these other owners know that they have some control over what they offer? I don't know what they know. I just know what they do. Or don't do in this case. Well, we'll get the word out on them. In a major way. I want franchisees selling whatever moves sales and sells lots of coffee. Any other problems you want to tell me about? Yeah, one big one. The cost of goods. What's the problem there? We still don't have enough stores in the South to leverage better prices from suppliers like you have in the Northeast. So our supply chain is shakier, and costs are higher and profits are lower than they ought to be. Hmm. I wasn't aware of that. Well, I assure you, I'm going to nationalize the supply chain. It will take a while, but I'll get it done. In the meantime, I appreciate your honesty, and I hope you won't leave the Duncan family. Well, it means a lot that you're willing to listen. That makes me want to stay. Look, we can't stop opening stores. That's critical to our business model. But we can do a better job of supporting you all. On that, you have my word. As the Texas owner hangs up, Travis is already dialing the next franchisee. He wants to hear about the company's problems right from the source and fix them. It's in everyone's interest. For Travis, one of the most exciting aspects of coming to Dunkin' Donuts is knowing that the private equity firms that took the company over, Bain Capital, the Carlyle Group, and Thomas H. Lee Partners, have big plans. He's well aware that he's been hired to get the company ready for when they're taken public in just a few years. But the VPs are feeling jittery about what Travis may have in mind. What kind of leader will he be? Will there be a massive reorganization? Or worse, will there be layoffs? On his first afternoon on the job, Travis summons them to a meeting. He stands, smiling at the head of the table, and looks around the room. All he sees are blank stares. He powers on, detailing his vision for Duncan. Improve operations. Move forward with technology and new food and beverage offerings. Widen the customer base and open more stores. And of course, the big dream of taking Dunkin' Donuts public in two or three years. Anyone want to add anything to that agenda? Any thoughts, questions? Silence. They have no idea how to respond. Travis's smile fades as he feels their tension. Every person at the table looks like they're about to be shot. He takes a deep breath. He loosens his tie. It's time to explain how he'll run this company. I'm an advocate of what I call the challenge culture. What that means is that I want you all to feel free to challenge my ideas, to push back at me. That's how we'll get the best solutions. The next day, Travis interviews each member of the leadership team. The question is, can they change and do they want to change? By the end of the day, it seems to Travis that hardly any of them have the ability to challenge him in the way he needs. Within weeks, most are fired. Travis is determined to surround himself with people who will join his challenge culture. In February, he calls a meeting of his new team. But it's not just any meeting. It's a test. Our costs are too high. We need to find ways to trim them. There are mutterings of general agreement. Then Travis gets more specific. There are a number of new hires in the budget. I think we could do with less. Everyone is silent. Travis turns to Paul Twohig, Dunkin' Donuts' new U.S. president who was poached from Starbucks. Paul, where do you stand? I think you're going way too far. Really? I thought you'd argue for even deeper cuts. 
but we've agreed to accelerate growth. We need a lot of strong talent to do it. We can't cut our way to greatness. Twohig has just challenged Travis. Head swivel to see how Travis will respond. Before he can, Twohig pipes up again. Hey, Nigel, you've been saying ad nauseum, I might add, that you want a culture of challenge. (laughs) Well, now you've got it. A smile spreads over Travis's face. Finally, he's gotten through. Conversation begins to flow. Everyone tosses out ideas. In the coming months, Travis and his team are consumed with launching new stores and new ideas. By the end of his first year as CEO, Dunkin' Donuts opens 350 new locations. They launch a contest online to create Dunkin's next donut and are flooded with 130,000 sugary submissions. The winner is a man from Hoover, Alabama, who calls his creation Toffee for Your Coffee, a glazed sour cream cake donut topped with a thick coating of chocolate and toffee Heath Bar pieces. Travis is thrilled by the contest's turnout. He's eager to boost customer engagement. As the recession deepens, Howard Schultz is still looking for ways to make customers fall in love with Starbucks again. As he ponders his options, he's come to depend on the support of a few close friends. One of them is Olden Lee, a former Pepsi executive who's on Starbucks' board of directors. In January 2009, Schultz and Lee meet for dinner at a quiet restaurant in New York. Olden, I've never stopped believing that Starbucks will come out of this okay, but every day I feel like I'm on an emotional roller coaster. That's understandable, but it won't damage the company as long as you keep it to yourself. Yeah, you're right. I know my mood has a domino effect. If I come across as confident, it it reassures my Starbucks partners. That's essential, because people are fearful right now. But I can't allow fear to hold us back. So I'm going to put a stake in the ground. We're going to do what people say can't be done and build a billion-dollar business on instant coffee. (coughs) What? Are you joking? Yeah, I know, I know. That'll be everyone's first reaction. But I'm dead serious. The problem with instant coffee is that no one's figured out how to make it taste great. But our R&D team has cracked the code. The potential is huge. I'm telling you, worldwide, instant coffee is a $21 billion market. In the UK, instant coffee accounts for 80% of all coffee sales. We could replicate that success in North America and expand our market. Schultz decides to move ahead with his plan. But on February 13th, 2009, four days before the official rollout, a headline appears on the investment website Motley Fool. No, Starbucks, please don't. The article describes the move as nonsensical. Instant coffee has a terrible reputation and enables customers to visit its stores less frequently. Finally, the article comes right out and asks, Is Howard Schultz panicking, getting desperate to show that management's doing something, anything? Schultz knows that for a company branded as the brew for connoisseurs, instant coffee is a venti-sized risk. Hey, did you know that a lot of conventional deodorants contain aluminum, which forms a plug in your sweat glands to keep you from sweating? Yeah, that didn't sound too pleasant, does it? Well, because of that, I've been meaning to try a natural deodorant for a while, so I'm thrilled that Native has just joined our show as a sponsor. See, Native deodorant is formulated without aluminum, parabens, or talc. Instead, it's made with ingredients you've actually heard of, like coconut oil and shea butter. So you're probably wondering about effectiveness. Well, I did too. Here's the great news. Making the switch to an aluminum-free deodorant does not mean you have to sacrifice on any of that performance. Native will keep you smelling and feeling fresh all day long. I love the light and fresh fragrance of cucumber and mint. It's, it's not overbearing like some deodorants can be. It doesn't feel chemically or dry on your skin. There's no perfumey smell. You just feel clean and ready to go. In fact, it's a feeling that lasts a long time, I know, because it keeps on going after my daily run. Classic native scents include cucumber and mint, but also coconut and vanilla, lavender rose, eucalyptus and mint. They all smell incredible. And, better yet, 
you can get 20% off your first purchase. Just visit nativedeodorant.com and use promo code BW during checkout. Don't forget about that promo code. That's nativedeodorant.com, promo code BW. February 2009. Reporters from every major outlet are gathered in a brightly lit Starbucks conference room. Schultz is making a big announcement. People are pouring cups of steaming coffee from the big carafes at the back of the room. A grinning Schultz takes the stage. I hope you're enjoying the coffee. Some take another sip, smile and nod. Because what you're tasting is Starbucks' new instant coffee. We call it Via. That's an Italian word that means street or route. But just because you're on the go doesn't mean you shouldn't demand excellence. Instant coffee? I can't believe it's just like regular coffee. He's delighted by their reactions and surprised faces. You can see that Via is not your mother's instant coffee. Schultz's instinct is rewarded. Starbucks introduces Via into stores with a week-long advertising campaign that highlights in-store taste tests pitting Via against Starbucks' own brewed coffee. It's instantly clear that customers love the convenience and even the taste. With 12 packets priced at $9.95, it's far less expensive than buying a dozen tall Starbucks coffees which sell for $1.50 apiece. In its first year, Via becomes the fifth best-selling brand of instant coffee, and sales increase substantially with each passing year. Next, Schultz wants to tackle the menu. In March 2009, the marketing team meets with the company's leadership and proudly talks about their offerings. We've mastered a difficult balancing act and created some brand new breakfast options. They're inexpensive enough for frugal customers, but special enough to appeal to our usual guests. For instance, there's a new artisan bacon sandwich made with a Parmesan egg frittata, smoked bacon, and Gouda cheese. And there's the artisan ham sandwich, also with a Parmesan egg frittata, plus three slices of Black Forest ham and mild cheddar. We're calling them breakfast pairings. They come with a 12-ounce tall coffee for $3.95. That's a bargain! and much tastier than anything offered by Dunkin' Donuts. Across the country, Nigel Travis takes note. For the third straight year, Dunkin' Donuts is rated number one in the coffee category for customer loyalty. But he knows that's not enough. In June 2009, Dunkin' Donuts introduces the 99-cent wake-up wrap, a toasted tortilla filled with scrambled egg and American cheese. With it, the marketers run an ad aimed right at Starbucks. They call it breakfast, not brokefast. Starbucks feels the heat. They're caught between two conflicting needs to remain the premium brand, yet find ways to retain price-sensitive customers. They come up with a Rob Peter to pay Paul solution. They cut prices on popular items like lattes by 5 to 15 cents, but raise prices on specialty drinks like the Frappuccino by 30 cents. It's too little, too late. 2010 is Dunkin's year. They sell more hot, regular, and iced coffee than any chain in the U.S., including Starbucks. And on July 27, 2011, Dunkin' Donuts goes public. As the opening bell sounds at the New York Stock Exchange, Nigel Travis and Paul Twohig, the director of U.S. operations, are fixated on the huge computer screen in Travis's office. Twohig has become Travis's most trusted ally. For all his experience, Travis has never taken a company public. As trading begins, he gets up from his chair and paces. He's excited and nervous. We figure shares will go for between $16 and $18. But look at that, 19 a share already. They watch the screen all day. The stock closes at close to $28 a share. They've raised about $442 million, making them one of the year's most successful IPOs. Even as Travis savors the thrill, it's not long before he turns to Twohig with a question. Paul, how do we top this? How do we keep the momentum going? He's right to be concerned. 
Starbucks isn't sitting still. By 2012, they're falling behind Starbucks when it comes to market share. Dunkin' Donut stores nationwide account for approximately 23% of the market, while Starbucks controls nearly 33%. But Dunkin' Donuts keeps pounding away at its rival. One of their most popular items is now a t-shirt sold in their online store. It reads, Friends don't let friends drink Starbucks. August 2013. Travis wrestles off his bed covers and lunges for the phone that's vibrating with incoming messages. Groggily, he picks up his smartphone and sees a flood of texts from the marketing team. Damn, what now? The British press is slamming Dunkin' Donuts over an ad being run by one of its franchise stores in Thailand. He quickly calls Karen Raskoff, the chief communications officer for Dunkin' Brands. Karen, what the hell is happening in Thailand? Well, unfortunately, the franchise there ran a TV ad for our dark chocolate donut, the one we're calling a charcoal donut. The daughter of the franchisee is in the ad. She's holding the donut in one hand and... Okay, so what's the problem? The problem is she's wearing blackface makeup. (sighs) Blackface? Yes, and a leading human rights group has called the ad bizarre and racist. (sighs) Apologize for it immediately! An hour later, Dunkin' Donuts issues a statement saying it recognizes the insensitivity of this spot and apologizes for any offense it caused. The problem blows over. Yet for Travis, who's always been unwilling to engage the company in political activities, this incident solidifies his resolve. But Howard Schultz, as always, is committed to a different path. It was mayhem. We saw these buildings catch on fire. This was a beauty supply store. And it's, we watched it just burn to the ground. The auto zone is on fire. This is the third building within two blocks and it is you know destroyed it's november 2014 howard schultz is at home watching televised images of cracked car windshields stores on fire groups of protesters marching through the streets of ferguson missouri they're chanting black lives matter the city erupted after a grand jury announced it would not charge the white police officer who shot and killed an unarmed black teenager 18 year old michael brown The main streets look like a war zone. And this comes three weeks after another unarmed black man, Eric Garner, died after being put in a chokehold by a police officer in New York City. Schultz is stunned and horrified as he watches Ferguson burn. For years, he's pondered the proper role for a for-profit public company. He's decided corporations have an obligation to improve society, even if it hurts their bottom line. And now, the uprising in Ferguson has moved him. Troubled that not enough attention is being paid to civil unrest, Schultz knows he can't sit this moment out. In mid-January 2015, the Starbucks board meets in a conference room in Costa Rica. It's near the coffee farm the company purchased a year ago. The deal was part of a billion-dollar commitment to ethically source 100% of its coffee by the end of this year. It's there that Schultz shares his idea. I think we should weigh in on the Black Lives Matter movement. I want our baristas to write the words race together on the side of our coffee cups. The board members glance at each other. I don't get this, Howard. Honestly, it sounds wacky. It's a way to prompt customers to engage in conversations about race relations. We'll tell baristas to start up conversations about race as they hand people their cups. Do you seriously think that people getting their morning latte want to talk about race relations? Come come on, we'll look ridiculous. Plus, it's a really volatile issue right now. Writing on cups is just silly. It's no way to address something this serious. Despite the concerns, Schultz pushes the plan forward. When the Race Together initiative begins, the backlash against the white billionaire and his company is immediate. The campaign becomes fodder for late-night comedy shows, but CBS Morning host Gail King soberly takes the company to task, reading one Twitter comment allowed on the air to make her point. 
not sure what Starbucks was thinking. I don't have time to explain 400 years of oppression to you and still make my train. And Twitter is on fire. Some users post pictures of themselves holding Starbucks cups that read iced white privilege and by any beans necessary. The Race Together campaign is promptly yanked. But despite the public drubbing, Schultz's message gets through to customers he's trying to target. Upscale customers who care about political issues and are willing to pay more for coffee than the everyman in line at Dunkin' Donuts. And soon, Schultz's judgment seems vindicated. In April, Starbucks releases its second quarter earnings report. Revenue and operating income have increased, driving their stock to an all-time high. But Starbucks is about to bungle another race issue, and this one will rock the company's progressive image to its core. In our next episode, Duncan drops the donuts, and when a Starbucks barista refuses to give up the keys, it ignites a national uproar. 